Hi there. Uh, I think that's just about as ready to start. Well, uh, thanks to everyone for coming along, uh, taking a couple hours at your afternoon is much appreciated. Uh, my name is Colin Tosh. I'm a senior agroforestry researcher at uh, ORC, the Organic Research Centre, and I'll be chairing the meeting today. So th this event uh, was funded by the uh, A Team Foundation Farm in the Future Initiative. Uh, this is a little uh, small project led by the Soil Association with the Organic Research Centre, the Land Workers Alliance and Partnership, and also the Farm uh, Woodland Forum. So there are two events planned. This one was supposed to coincide with uh, COP15, the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, and the topic of this one is the, the, the role of agroforestry and, and conserving biological diversity. But of course, the, the, the COP15 has come and gone. The, the, there was one point when it was supposed to be around about now, but I think the, the bulk of it shifted the next year. So we didn't feel we could wait and we, we've just gone ahead with it. The, the SIGIT meeting will be on uh, agroforestry's role in carbon sequestration and storage. Uh, that'll be, uh, I'm looking at my piece of paper here, it's recently been announced, announced 23rd of November, 3.30 to 5pm, that'll be an in-person event at the Northern Real Farming Conference. So uh, if you want to attend that, it may be streamed, I think it, I think it is streamed, but uh, you may want to go along to the Northern, Northern Real Farming uh, Conference on the 23rd of November to, to, to see that session in person. Uh, so both these events will will output uh, each will each will output a policy brief that will be sent to key policy makers uh, within the UK certainly maybe some in Europe as well. Right. Uh, so I don't need to remind you what's happening with biodiversity worldwide in the UK as well. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund recently produced a report, I think it's called the Living Planet Index, looking at uh, abundance, the relative abundance of uh, various uh, thousands of vertebrate species uh, relative to 1970, and most of them have dropped by 60%, uh, which is a fairly shocking statistic. So we all know what's going on, and we also, it's also no secret that agriculture's uh, a big culprit in this biodiversity loss. But I think it's worth pointing out that uh, the reason why agriculture is a big culprit in, in countries like UK and the reason why it's a big culprit in many developing countries in the tropics is quite different. Whereas uh, actual uh, loss of primary habitat is the main issue, I guess, in, in many uh, developing tropical countries. You know, the, the amount of land in the UK since 1970 dedicated to farming has got up a little, but not dramatically. So the, the, the issue in the UK is really intensification of farming. It's been uh, 50 years ago, there would be, uh, you know, there was lots of lovely uh, hay meadow full of flowers. All that's been uh, lost more or less and converted into monoculture pasture for high levels of NPK use. And uh, arable land has gone from when I was a kid in the 1970s to something that had uh, quite a lot of wild flowers, even within the field and the understory of the field and round about it through, through pesticide and, and herbicide use. Essentially, insects and wild plants and, and most other organisms have been essentially excluded from these, from these areas. So, you know, agriculture takes up 70% of land in the UK. So essentially, to, to convert that in, all, all into strict monoculture, we know we're, we're no, we're, we're no other organisms essentially, which is what ha has happened to some extent. Is is, a, is, is the con probably the main contributing factor? But there's also evidence to suggest global warming is beginning to have an effect on animals and ag agro ecosystems as well. So, uh, uh, if I could just show my first slide. Uh, so this is uh, this uh, is the uh, this is the document that will be ratified at the biodiversity conference, the first draft on the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. It's in its first draft at the moment. 
they need to sit at this conference and flash things out and decide what the final version is going to look at. But what seems to have been agreed on so far is this uh, theory of change framework. So, so at the moment, we've, we've uh, suffered non-sustainable biodiversity loss. Uh, we're considered right at the moment, around around about now, 2020, to be in a tools and solutions phase to this. We, we're trying to think up ways to, to, to ameliorate this. Uh, moving towards 30, 2030, we go into a sort of an action phase where milestones are met, where threats are reduced while meeting people's needs. This is a big theme. Um, by 2030, there's, there's a bunch of action, action points that are supposed to, supposed to, we're supposed to be acting out, and then that'll go towards the ultimate goal, which is living in harmony with nature. So uh, the, the, the UN biodiversity framework sees biodiversity restoration going in, going in hand with making sure human needs are met, benefits are shared equitably, and there's a, an appropriate means of implementation. Uh, so the, the relating to agroforestry, probably the most uh, relevant target is this one here, target 10 in the 2030 action points to ensure all areas under agriculture, aquaculture and forestry are managed sustainably, in particular through the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, increasing the productivity and resilience of these production systems. So product Productivity and resilience and uh, restoring biodiversity are key there. And uh, agroforestry, uh, agroforestry is, is particularly uh, suitable for that. This is a picture of Mediterranean silvo arable system where uh, kind of uh, an unusual system to many uh, who are used to seeing monocultures where, where wheat feet, where essentially an orchard, these are almond and mixture of almond and poplar trees. The orchard is essentially grown on top of the wheat field. And uh, if, if you look at uh, something called a land equivalent ratio, you can find that the uh, you, you find that the, the amount of total yield output from that field is far greater than, than it would be than these two uh, uh, crop. Well, let me put it another way. You would need more space to obtain the same yield if you grew them in monoculture separately. You need one and a half fields. Whereas if you slap one on top of the other, you can grow the, the same, uh, you know, a large yield and a, and a minimum of space. You use the dimension to 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 your advantage here. Uh, the the trees essentially take up no x y space here, and you know they, they grow upwards. Uh, and trees are also inherently, of course, trees are also uh, uh, inherently biodiverse. Uh, you know, old studies. Uh, In, in the tropics and in the UK, it's been shown that trees trees hold a gigantic number of different species of invertebrates and so on. They're inherently biodiverse species, uh, and of course, they can they can promote the resilience, the shading effects, uh, uh, the 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 reduction in wind speed that trees like this will 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 affect on the crop can make them. Uh, can can make the system a little more robust to ex uh, environmental extremes. The, the most recent modeling studies suggest about a thirty percent dampening dampening effect of environmental extremes using agroforestry, which could be very significant in the future. And the finally, the the, the trees also diversify input for the farmer, so. Farmers can grow trees for timber, they can grow from fruit, they can grow for grow them for nuts, it diversifies their output. So th there's a lot of uh, evidence uh, accumulating and there's a lot of big projects on the go looking at how agroforestry improves the resilience of the farm. Uh, fa uh, agroforestry is fairly uncommon. Uh, in, in the UK relative to a lot of other countries, this map here, this map in the top left shows the incidence of all agroforestry. It's very common in, uh, and this is ties into the ties into this plot as well, it's very common in Portugal, Greece, Spain, Bulgaria, and the United Kingdom has about two, just over 2% of land area, I think it's nearly near or three actually, uh, dedicated to agroforestry, whereas countries like Portugal have about 13% of the major part of the agricultural lands. So uh, what's happening, uh, the, the future, however, I think for agroforestry in the, in the UK is looking pretty bright. Uh, the Organic Research Centre, along with uh, 
along with the Woodland Trust, the Soil Association, Ab Abacus Agriculture have been handed this uh, agroforestry test project, which will feed back to DEFRA and, and allow them to consider how agroforestry might be built into M ELM. So just a reminder of ELM has three components. In 2019, these three components were stated, and then there's a bunch of tests and trials projects that researchers and farmers and land managers uh, take part in, and then the details of these three components around will be thrashed out and implemented by 2020. Uh, so, so, so that's essentially the process. The ELM test, which uh, ORC and these other uh, project uh, groups are leading, uh, we've, we have decided to consider uh, in the context of agroforestry, the role of advice and guidance and payment mechanisms. We are, we've, we've got 36 uh, farmers either interested in agroforestry or actively practicing agroforestry, and we've already done an evidence review, we've done interviews with these, and we're in the process of taking a bunch of regional workshops to get input from these farmers. And then in 2023, when the project finishes, we'll feed back to DEFRA, and hopefully, fingers crossed, that will allow them to, to come up with a, with a nice uh, payment, uh, enticing payment mechanism for farmers to practice agroforestry in the UK with an L. So that's about it uh, from me. Let me stop sharing this uh, screen. Uh, I can. So uh, yeah, we, we have three terrific speakers today. Uh, we have Tom Stanton, he's, who's finishing his PhD at the University of Reading on uh, bi agroforestry and biodiversity and arable systems. We have Caroline Richards, who spent, uh, he, she spent most of her career working in South America in agriculture, but she's now returned to the UK and she has uh, 400 acres of conservation agriculture in Devon, in which she's she's practicing silvopasture, which is the incorporation of uh, livestock and trees. And we have Helen Cheshire, she's a senior farming advisor at the Woodland Trust. Uh, she's also a lead partner in the agroforestry uh, elm test along with ORC US. And she leads the uh, Trees for Your Farm scheme, which is run by the Woodland Trust, which, which we, after interviewing the, the elm test, uh, farmers we, we discover is a fairly major source of funding for, uh, to date for agroforestry in the UK. Just a summary of rules for the day. Uh, we have over about 150 people uh, uh, signed up for this. Uh, I'm not sure if they're all here yet, but uh, we thought it might be a bit chaotic to have a sort of a free forum hands up thing. So, so we're not going to operate the hands up function at all, unfortunately. Uh, any questions you, you would like to ask, I want, I'll ask you to, to ask them in the chat. Uh, and if you'd like to ask uh, questions addressed specifically to individuals, Helen, Tom or Carolyn, could ask you to make that clear, maybe prefix your question with for Helen or for Tom. If you have uh, questions for the general discussion session, which will happen after the presentations uh, at uh, 3.20, then if you could you could prefix your question with the general. Uh, there'll, be, there'll be five minutes or so to ask questions after each presentation. So uh, I will probably ask the question that you submit and then uh, I, I may ask I may ask the person that submitted the question of you know, the present at the meeting today to to unmute himself and they can they can have a little chat with they can reply to the response and have a little chat. So I hope that's clear. So I'll pass you over uh, firstly to uh, Tom, who's going to give the the first talk today on agroforestry and pest natural enemy and pollinator diversity and, and UK arable systems. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Colin. Okay, I trust you can all see that and you can all hear me okay. I'll get started. Um, so yeah, this, this first talk, um, I'll be giving you a, a research perspective really on agroforestry and biodiversity. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the research we've been doing. I'm based at the University of Reading, uh, collaborating with uh, various other researchers, as you can see here. And our research is particularly focused on the applied uh, perspective of biodiversity for agriculture. So in terms of crop pests, their natural enemies, which are predators and parasitoids, and also crop pollinators. 
So I expect most of you are familiar with agroforestry. Um, basically, agroforestry is farming with trees. So it's the intentional integration of trees into crops or pasture. Here you can see lots of examples of agroforestry systems. And the thing I would highlight here is the diversity of different agroforestry systems. So it can take many forms. Um, for example, um, we have uh, silver pasture systems, which are, um, let me just get a spotlight. Um, yeah, so silver pasture systems in the top left here, um, which are obviously very historic and traditional as well as um, more recent innovative systems like uh, alley cropping, where trees are intercropped with um, cereals or other arable crops. And so why do we need biodiversity? And Colin's already touched on um, the importance of biodiversity and, and um, why we need to conserve it. And again, I'm sure most of you are familiar with some of these issues, but just to briefly summarize two key services that we're particularly interested in, uh, in our research group. Firstly, natural pest control. So obviously insect pests cause a lot of crop damage globally. And our conventional methods for controlling these insect pests um, heavily rely on application of pesticides. Of course, I'm sure many of you are aware of lots of the uh, environmental and ecological ecological concerns of widespread pesticide use and also the issue of pesticide resistance um, so we need to continually develop new products um, to keep on top of the pests whereas natural pest control which is where we try to encourage the naturally occurring predators and parasitoids of pests can be seen as a more sustainable option in addition biodiversity is important for pollination so many of our food crops are heavily dependent on pollination, as I'm sure you're aware. And at the moment, we're very reliant on managed pollinators, particularly honeybee colonies. But there's concern about the sustainability of um, that reliance on uh, managed pollinators, for example, if uh, in terms of diseases or colony collapses. And so while pollinators can, be, can actually be more effective pollinators and also they're a more sustainable um, way of pollinating our crops into the future. So what do we know so far about biodiversity in agroforestry? Well, there was a PhD um, also at Reading University before me, which looked at biodiversity in agroforestry. And butterflies are a really good indicator of biodiversity. They respond to um, plant diversity, and so they're, they're a good indicator. And this study found significantly higher diversity of butterfly species in agroforestry systems in the UK compared to uh, monocultures of arable or pasture. And similarly, that study found twice as many solitary bees and hoverflies in agroforestry systems. Obviously, that's important then for crop pollination. And this is all supported by um, a recent review of biodiversity across agroforestry in Europe. And in this review, um, they picked out four um, species groups. Um, and uh, so that in this plot here, we're looking at the comparison of agroforestry versus monocultures or crops or pasture. And here we can see. For all four of the groups, the average biodiversity in agroforestry was higher than, the, than in the equivalent to monocultures, and particularly strong effect on birds you can see there. So in our, our research, we were particularly interested in looking at what the costs and benefits of that biodiversity are in agroforestry. So the costs being things like pests and weeds, the benefits being things like the natural enemies, the natural pest control, and the crop pollinators. And also how can we try to optimize these benefits of biodiversity through appropriate management? So to explore these questions, uh, we've particularly focused on three study sites in the UK. All of these sites were, uh, were working farms. 
and all of them had an agroforestry field and an arable field under the same management and crop rotation, so we could compare the two systems. So here's a drone photo of one of our field sites. In the main part of the picture here, you can see the agroforestry field. Um, and then just in the corner on the right hand side, uh, you can see part of the arable control field. So we can compare the two side by side across the three sites. So the agroforestry were all, um, they were all arable systems. They were based on alley cropping, which is where rows of trees are intercropped with um, arable crops. And the trees in these systems were mostly fruit trees, mostly apples actually, under sown with a flower mix to provide biodiversity benefits. And the crop rotations in the alleys were based around cereals. So just to start off with biodiversity, looking at overall biodiversity, our results really supported those previous studies I mentioned before. So we found significantly higher diversity of plants and insects or invertebrates in agroforestry compared to the crop alleys. But we were, we were particularly interested in looking at this in more detail and thinking about which species particularly benefit from agroforestry. So are the benefits of agroforestry universal across all species or are there some particularly some particular species which agroforestry is, is targeting? And what we found when we looked at the species community in agroforestry was that it was moving towards a more natural community. And by that, I mean, it's moving towards a more grassland, woodland species. So, for example, the plants associated with agroforestry tended to be more perennial. They tended to be more creeping rather than seed spreading plants. And also they tended to be more later flowering. And these are all characteristics we see in more grassland plants. And this is, um, I should say, this is just in the crop alleys in the agroforestry, so it doesn't even take into, into account the tree rows. And this obviously has implications for weed management. So, for example, a, a, a weed like a creeping thistle or bindweed, uh, which, is, which are perennial creepers, can be more of a challenge in agroforestry, particularly if they get a hold in the tree rows. Whereas a weed like black grass, which is annual and seed spreading, is less of a challenge in agroforestry because weeds like that are really um, well adapted to these high disturbance arable conditions. And so the invertebrates or the insects associated with agroforestry tended to be, uh, tended to be unwinged. So um, these are less mobile invertebrates, which seem to, be seem to benefit from these habitat corridors in agroforestry fields. So for example, spiders seem to love these tree rows. They tended to be more specialist, uh, like these parasitoids, which are good for apic control and also seed eating uh, invertebrates. And also they tend to um, require some, uh, some, have some requirement for year round vegetation in their life cycle. So again, we're looking more at grassland species often in these agroforestry systems compared to arable fields. So what does that mean for pest management in agroforestry? Well, we looked at functional diversity of natural enemies and functional diversity is really just an indicator of um, biocontrol. So we look at the um, functional characteristics of predators and parasitoids, and we found significantly higher functional diversity of natural enemies in agroforestry. And this is likely to indicate a higher level of um, predation or parasitism of pests. But overall, really, we see a change in pest management. And I'll illustrate this uh, just using this, uh, using this figure. So um, there's quite a lot going on here. So perhaps just focus on the, on the bottom part here. So this figure shows eight different species or species groups. And the arrows indicate the effect of agroforestry um, on, their, on their abundance. So the, the, three species on the three species on the left here were all significantly suppressed in agroforestry compared to arable fields. The three in the middle, there was no, no significant difference between the two. And the two on the right, there was quite a lot of variation, but on average, they were significantly more abundant in agroforestry. And we can explain this in terms of their traits, uh, their characteristics. The species, species on the left tend to be more mobile. They're attracted to certain resources in arable fields. 
Whereas those on the right are less mobile and they're benefiting from some resource provided by the tree rows. So we can start to explain um, why, um, why pest management uh, is different really in agroforestry compared to arable fields. In terms of the effects on wild pollinators, uh, the, uh, the, re the effect here is much more simple. So we see much more universal benefits across a uh, range of wild pollinators. I'll highlight here this point on the right, which is the small solitary bees. And these bees were significantly um, or most substantially benefited from agroforestry, which is interesting because these smaller bees tend to be more vulnerable to population declines, they're more sensitive to disturbance and habitat fragmentation. And so this suggests that agroforestry is a really could be a key tool in helping to uh, restore these threatened bees uh, back into agriculture. So next we wanted to go beyond by the purely looking at biodiversity and look at the effect on um, crop production. So we took some yield samples, again, comparing the agroforestry to the arable fields. And uh, firstly, at the top here, we looked at oats, and there wasn't any significant difference here in yields between the agroforestry and arable fields. Um, so this takes into account the tree rows, so I'm just talking about the crop alleys versus the arable fields. Whereas in the barley or wheat, there was a slight reduction by about 11% uh, in the agroforestry crop alleys. But I would just point out that this is just a snapshot over two years. Um, so there could be uh, long-term benefits in terms of agroforestry, in terms of the microclimate regulation um, and uh, reducing the risk of pest outbreaks. Uh, we did find that weed cover was negatively associated with a crop yield, as you might expect, but that was equal in both farming systems. And we didn't find any association of slug abundance with crop yield, so there's no evidence that they were impacting the, the yield. And we also did some economic modelling. I haven't got time to go into that much, um, but we've just published a paper on that, looking at the um, farm income from uh, these agroforestry systems into cropping fruit trees with arable crops and found that they they can be more um, profitable than the arable farming but it's very heavily dependent on the yield and price of the tree crop um, which in this system is apples so finally i just want to mention a um, an experiment we did looking at understory management in these agroforestry systems and the understory being the vegetation below the trees. So here we simply compared two cutting regimes. In the first regime, we, um, we let the vegetation grow tall and the vegetation was seeded with a flower mix. So it was a nice flowering, um, flowering mix in the summer. In the alternative treatment, we, we cut the vegetation once a month to suppress the flowers. And then we compared the two management options on tree pests and their natural enemies, and on crop pests and their natural enemies, on apple pest damage, on pollinator visitation of apple flowers, and on farm income. And we found that there were multiple benefits of having these flowering understories under the trees. So we found significantly more pollinators visiting the apple flowers above the flowering understories, also significantly more predators in the trees early in the season, that then led to a reduction in apple aphids in the trees, which in turn led to a, re a significant reduction in apple fruit damage from aphids. And that's all above these flowering understories compared to the lone understories. There was also significantly high diversity of ground predators and parasitoids. And that led to reductions in some arable pests like thrips. And all of that led to a, an increase in predicted farm income which was mainly because of the reduced fruit damage from the aphids. So to conclude, we saw that agroforestry increases plant and insect diversity, and it's moving towards a more natural community, so more grassland species. But there was mixed effects on pests and weeds, um, so it's really leads to a change in pest and weed management, and we can explain this in terms of their traits. There's more consistent benefits of agroforestry on wild pollinators. And we saw that the yield effects may depend on the crop. So oats seem to be a good option in agroforestry. They might be more competitive with weeds and possibly more competitive um, 
growing alongside trees. And finally, we saw that these flowering understories can enhance biodiversity benefits and particularly the, um, the beneficial aspects of biodiversity like the predators and the pollinators. So with that, thank you for listening. Um, and I'd welcome any questions either now or later in the, in the discussion. Thank you. Thanks for that, Tom. Uh, we don't really have time for questions, but, but I'll ask a, a really quick one, if you can answer it quickly. Uh, Bill Grayson in the audience uh, has asked, in organic systems, would you expect to rotate your arable crops of clover-based lays grazed, grazed by livestock? Would this work? Would this, would this type of system work? Yeah, I should do. Um, I mean, if, if it's grazed by livestock, um, I expect you would need some tree protection. Um, you need some fencing along your tree rows um, to protect them. Um, I mean, one, of the, one of our study sites, um, in fact, two of our study sites were organic, um, and one of them did have a, a two-year um, clover break, um, but I don't think they use livestock in that. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, I think if, if livestock are introduced, it's, it's just tree protection is a thing to bear in mind. My impression is that a lot of agroforestries are fairly, ver fairly versatile, you know, you can switch from pastoral to, to silvo arable relatively easily, you know, they can accommodate them. Yeah, indeed, yeah, 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 there are, there are systems that do that, that, um, that do have, um, yeah, switch between the two, yeah. Sorry, I would have loved to answer, uh, ask some more questions, but uh, we don't really have uh, time, so I'm going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, who is Caroline Richards. Uh, she is a farmer in Devon, practicing silver pasture. So uh, over to you, Caroline. Thank you very much. Um, we'll just pop up a slide or two. Right, so can you see that, you guys? Good, excellent, right. Uh, okay, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Caroline Richards. Um, and uh, yeah, we moved to Devon nine years ago, um, bought um, a farm, uh, largely because we just love the land. So here we are, this is our, our world, rural Devon. You could see that uh, you're looking at most of the farm, lots of, um, lots of trees and uh, lots of a certain amount we have a variety of crops, so we grow standard field crops like uh, winter wheat. If you look at the first field on the right, you can then see sort of frilly bits around the outside. That's our um, uh, bird seed mix to feed birds throughout the, uh, the winter. Um, we have uh, a lovely uh, mix of uh, woodland running through our fields, uh, so we have permanent grassland with low inputs, which is on the right of this picture, and with higher inputs, which is kind of a strip across the, the middle, more intensive grazing land. So there we are, this is a map of the farm, and you can see the farm is in the middle of the land, and we're surrounded uh, by woodland, bits of woodland, and the um, each woodland is more or less linked to another bit of woodland by more woodland. So that's uh, excellent. Lots of wildlife corridors. And what we have done over the last nine years is work on improving those, uh, that communi communi um, activity, what, how on earth is that? Connectivity uh, of the woodlands. Because uh, when you're looking at um, increasing your biodiversity and also sus sustaining the biodiversity you've got, uh, you need to take care of, of these sort of things. Uh, so you see on the bottom there, we have uh, permanent grassland, uh, temporary grassland, an arable rotation, and then we go on to the more entertaining stuff, the rush pastures, um, and, uh, and then quite a, a variation given the small amount of woodland of the sort of woodland we've got, uh, some wet woodland, uh, which is you know, uh, a big bat habitat by, by biosphere action plan habitat, um, not very common, uh, a lot of it's been drained. And so very important for squidgy revolting things and um, fungi, lichen, 
just not not very kind of uh, trendy or attractive animals or or organisms, but very important in the in the whole um, web of life. Uh, we have the more the, the cuter stuff. We have the brown hairs, dormice, otters. We have night jars, barn owls, and primroses. I see as a um, a, a bat species. So uh, we're very lucky. We bought the place because we recognised it was a huge nature reserve. So we need to do what we need to do. It's a proper farm. It needs to earn its living. And so the art, I think, is to um, get some more productivity out of the land and yet do things to support the biodiversity we have and to see if we can increase uh, that biodiversity. So I'm going to tell you what, what we produce and also what we've done over the last nine years to support our biodiversity. So what we produce is these are lovely South Devon cattle, uh, pasture-fed beef. Uh, in our on the arable, we produce feed feed wheat, feed maize, um, grass keep, uh, grow very good grass in Devon, lots of rain, grass silage, haylage from the woods. We produce firewood, saw logs, sawn timber, and coppice products. So major um, income for the farm from that little lot uh, is the grass keep, uh, the firewood, the beef, and uh, some land rent that comes in with the, um, with the arable crops. So biodiversity wise, what have we got? We've got uh, wet woodland often referred to as the temperate rainforest, which is very diverse and um, unthreatened. A lot of it's been um, drained or just clear felled and had conifers uh, uh, planted on it. We're lucky enough to have most of our woodland is uh, ancient semi-natural woodland with a very diverse ground flora according to the soil, veteran trees, it's also got a lot of productive trees uh, so we're lucky on that. Uh, bird species, lots of them, there's over 70 on the list and but they include Willow tits, which are rare and quite specific in their uh, habitat requirements. Uh, so I feel very fortunate to have them. And we have uh, uh, several large raptors uh, sculling about the place. So mammals, amazing. My, my, ba my uh, background is in um, uh, mammal ecology and uh, delighted to find dormice, my little friends, uh, brown hares, weasels, hedgehogs, deer, not so fond of those, um, they eat my trees. Um, squirrels, rabbits, otters, wood mice, everything is here. And seven species of bat, quite amazing, which just shows the, spe the habitat diversity that this place offers. Um, given, I suppose we're agroforestry to begin with because there is so much, uh, so many trees around the trees. And so what have we done? We've looked at uh, species specific management. So willow tits and dormice are our, um, our poster ch children really. Uh, so as we have thinned the woodlands, um, we've been concentrating on managing the woodland structure to give more shrubby growth and cover for birds, uh, specifically willow tits. They like low growing shrubby things, uh, lots of insects for them to eat. And dormice are the same. Dormice eat, uh, everybody thinks they just eat hazelnuts. They don't eat anything that doesn't move too fast. Um, woodland thinning is one thing we've done, um, takes out the firewood and it regenerates the, uh, the woodland. And so now we're beginning to see um, a lot of regrowth coming through from the uh, areas that we've thinned. Um, before. Uh, we've create, created glades which uh, provide sheltered areas which and again the glorious sh shrubby growth and flowering plants which supports um, the, the butterflies as our indicator of biodiversity, other insects and it all provides food for bats, birds and small mammals. Um, one major feature of this uh, area is the hedgerows. Devon hedgerows are amazing. They're so diverse. I think you've got 10, if you go around count how many species there are on a hedgerow, 10 species for every 100 years of its existence. 
and you know, there are a lot of very ancient hedges. And uh, so they are well worth um, looking after. They provide wildlife corridors between our woodland parcels. And they also do a really good job on the agroforestry uh, aspect of providing shelter for the stock and the crops. And the field sizes here are not huge. Our biggest field is 30 acres. And it's you know, referred to in terms of awe because it is 30 acres. Most of them are much less than that, five, six acres. And so they get a lot of shelter from the trees around. Um, our pasture management, we have uh, got, we are trying to um, do rotational grazing and provide a variety of sward heights within the pasture. So that again gives you the diversity of. Um, of, of, of for, for insects and birds. Um, and we also maintain headlong, headlands along the hedgerows in the arable fields, just to give a, a, a break um, between the two terribly different uh, environments. And we've taken parts of, of the farm out of management. So little rough areas of rough pasture, which again is very important for your small mammal um, and consequently your, um, your raptor population. So what have we done in the last nine years to, uh, to promote our, our biodiversity? And also more importantly, as importantly, how have we funded it? Because um, farming doesn't make much money. Uh, when you buy a rundown farm like this, then it's a large black hole into which you cast your, 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 your pounds. Um, but, and that there is help out there and it is essential to, um, to a farmer, for, both for advice, ideas, and for funding, because all these things cost money and there's enough to do on a farm uh, without doing too much, um, doing too much else. So hedgerow restoration, uh, we've uh, selected hedgerows that were not very good and we've been laying them to renew them and thicken the bases. And we've also done new hedge planting. Um, so this is, as I, I've mentioned before, essential to the plan to create and augment wildlife corridors. And we, to do that, we used a countryside stewardship capital grant, which is a very good grant because it actually pays for the work to be done, um, not just um, 20 or 30%. Woodland management has been another major um, investment in time and, and uh, effort. Uh, sequential thinning of the unmanaged woodland. <laughs> I see we've got firewood and swan timber, sawn timber from this source. So we get a good revenue stream for that, which supports farm staff um, employment, opens up the woodland, promotes regeneration of the understory in the herd layer, and it's a rich wildlife habitat. So once again, countryside stewardship has been helping with that. Higher tier agreement gives you a, a certain amount per hectare to manage your woodlands, which is, again, it's essential. Uh, land management. Uh, we are members of the countryside stewardship mid-tier, so we've, it gives us support to reduce inputs on our permanent pastures, which helps increase and maintain species diversity. It also helps you, pays you to take field corners out of management, uh, which, which again increases your species by diversity. Um, so all the things... Uh, and we've sown seed bearing crops um, to provide bird food in the winter and through the hungry gap uh, in the spring. And then one of the first things we, we, we did was um, find the catchment sensitive farming grant, uh, which helped us uh, fence part of the farm, um, basically the, the water courses, because the stock had access to all the water courses. <coughs> Sorry, and animals were wandering through the um, streams, wrecking the ground, no herb and shrub layer. And so what's happened since we've fenced those water courses is that we get the, the herb and shrub layer has regenerated 
and the soil around those streams is much more secure. It also gives shelter for, for birds, insects and small mammals. And the water's clean, so win, win, win. Uh, so that was a, a very good investment and helped by the catchment sensitive farming grant. Uh, while uh, doing other works, <clears throat> we've um, adjusted our wetland and pond habitats, dug the odd pond, and although there was funding for it, we needed to sort out the drainage on a field. And uh, that worked really well. We did it all by ourselves. <coughs> One of our latest um, entertainments has been uh, the Culm Grassland Restoration Project, which is run by Devon Wildlife Fund. It's just finished. So we have um, quite a lot of, of soft rush dominated fields, which were not very um, diverse and, um, and not very good for grazing either. So uh, Devon Wildlife came along, provided the information and the support and a uh, certain amount of funding to reseed, to overseed these pastures um, with culm grassland uh, vegetation. A culm grassland I'd never heard of. It's uh, pe peculiar to the southwest of England and it's uh, a habitat which supports a lot of wildlife and uh, great plant diversity. And most of it has been lost over the last 50 years. So this big drive to um, increase it has, uh, has been very successful. Uh, now we manage it as a hay meadow and um, as a, a low input um, pasture. So we, we don't put any fertilizer on it at all. And uh, once again, that is supported because of course, if you don't actually feed your grass, you don't get so much and you can't put so many animals on it. So that really does affect your, um, your cash flow. So that's supported by the countryside stewardship um, in the mid-tier um, bit. So now we go to silver pasture. You get in, involved with all these things. Silver pasture project. This is a, a project uh, in the southwest. Uh, I think there are another six farms that are doing this. Organised by uh, WAG, the Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group. The Woodland Trust provided the funding, the trees and gardens, and the fencing. Very importantly, the fencing. Very expensive bit. Trees are not very expensive, really. Um, and then we've got research. So this is a research project. Um, supported by Rothamsted Research and um, various other people are appearing on the horizon because it is a really, really interesting um, project in that we have just planted trees in fields on, but we, we, we've been organised by um, FWAG, Woodland Trust and Rothamsted Research on how we plant them and a, a variety of different uh, ways. So we've got uh, ones which will act as, as living barns, so big trees in the middle, but you know, oaks and stuff like that, smaller stuff like birch and alder uh, on either side, and then shrubs along the side. side. So we end up with a, a beautifully sort of domed um, cross section across this piece of woodland with shelter and, and food there for your animals. Um, so that will be. Uh, I think very successful. And we've also planted different, other different designs as copses with tall trees in the middle, smaller ones around the outside and then shrubs around the outside of that. So there's various things being looked at, uh, animal behavior. Um, the research does show there is a benefit to shelter, um, to, to the animals from the shelter and security offered by the trees. Um, that dairy cows in particular spend a lot more time mutual grooming, they're much more, um, relaxed and um, happier, happier, happier animals. And uh, also you get, uh, again, you get the biodiversity increase as the sward um, varies according to how much shade there is. And uh, for your animals, more varied nutrition because the trees are available for browsing. And this structural diversity with the trees should increase your biological diversity of bats, birds and insects. Um, and then, of course, there's the, uh, the latest thing, how to fix your soil carbon. So um, that should also improve. So, but this, this is all um, being monitored by um, Rothamsted and their soil scientists. So that should be 
really, really interesting and um, very exciting project to be involved with, really. Ah, there we are. One newly planted silver pasture um, green barn. Just watch this space for the next eight or nine years. It'll look a lot better next year, I'm sure. Um, one thing I'd like to say is, is um, that the, the funding and advice and help that you get from various organizations is essential in this process because most farmers don't know much about ecology, especially the younger ones. And they, you know, we bought a hunk, 400 acres of Devon and thought, ah, what do we do? So we went to West Country Rivers Trust, Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, the uh, wildlife, um, they're not on there, Devon Wildlife Fund, whoops, um, and joined the Tor Valley Facilitation Fund, who are uh, look, provide a catchment vision of what should be happening. And also they give you support and information sharing. You meet up with other farmers um, who have the same sort of ideas about getting involved in this sort of uh, project. Um, funding, countryside stewardship has been invaluable, absolutely invaluable. And uh, Woods for Water do grants for planting woods. And uh, then following the ash dieback that we're getting, then my woods will be much more diverse uh, once I replant them, having cleared off the, um, the dead, uh, dead, dead ash that are there. So, you know, it's an it's a ongoing thing. There we go. That's it. That's me. Thanks very much, Carla. That was excellent. Uh, there's one question uh, from uh, Bill Grayson. He asks of these, uh, what, what, what is the breed of cows you, you have there? Or? South well, yeah. Sorry? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, he wonders if it's necessary for you to grow feed crops for these cows. No, they're not feed crops for me. This is cash. Oh, okay. So, this so is, I, not... I rent, I rent, I, sh I share crop. I, I, I run a share crop with my neighbour and he oh. buys the feed for his dairy cows. Ah, oh, okay. So it's necessary for something. So no, 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 only pasture bed. No. Ah, okay. Ah, uh, well, oh, yeah. Okay, I think that was the only question we have so far. Although I'm sure more more will come in. Uh, for, you know, we have quite a few extra questions for Tom have come in. So please do keep the questions coming in. We can probably answer some of them later on. Uh, can I ask you to mute uh, Caroline, and I'll we'll move on to to Helen uh, uh, from the Woodland Trust, who's uh, going to talk about uh, policy and and funding. Uh, issues around about agroforestry and, and its relation to biodiversity. Hi, thanks very much, um, Colin, and welcome everybody. And I'm delighted to be here today to hopefully generate some really interesting discussion after I finish speaking. Um, right, so I'm not going to talk about what agroforestry is because I think um, Tom and Karen have to give some really good explanations other than just to reiterate that um, we're talking about agroforestry in its broadest sense, everything from hedgerows to alley cropping and uh, wood pasture and shelter belts. And I think we, just to bear in mind the wide diversity of services and goods that agroforestry systems can deliver, both those environmental services to the farming business, the wide array of public goods to society and, you know, marketable products or products that can be used internally on the farm. And again, I'll just kind of give an overview of the biodiversity benefits of agroforestry. Um, obviously, it provides an increased range of habitat resource, both in scale and diversity, providing an excellent resource in terms of breeding, feeding and sheltering for a wide range of insect animal um, populations. It can also help to improve the restoration of, of biodiversity by improving the ecological connectivity across a landscape. And of course, it can um, buffer and help protect biodiversity value of existing habitats, for example, preventing spray drift entering watercourses or helping to reduce the ammonia impacts on ancient woodland. And research shows that agroforestry systems have on average the potential to increase biodiversity by more than twofold. 
I'm just going to touch very briefly on the global agroforestry policy scene. Um, United Nations Sustainability Goals, they published a report about three years ago where they highlighted the importance of agroforestry in delivering um, nine of the 17 sustainability goals. Turning a bit closer to home in terms of the EU, uh, it was in 2005 that the EU recognised the ecological and social value of agroforestry. Um, and they supported it primarily through the Common Agricultural Policies, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. From 2014, agroforestry was an eligible practice for Pillar 1, um, with the exception that on an arable field, it had to be 100 trees per hectare or less. Um, it was also part and linked to the cross-compliance requirements and the greening payments. And they provided support through Pillar 2 for both the establishment and uh, maintenance of agroforestry systems. But the uptake was low um, and they felt that this was due to the complexity of rules as well as the lack of knowledge within the farming sector. Post 2020, the common agricultural policy is shifting from a compliance focus to more of a performance one. So again, this would indicate really good opportunities for agroforestry going forward if they can overcome those barriers. What about the state of agroforestry in the UK? Um, as Colin alluded to, um, we don't know much about the state of agroforestry in the UK and the, the statistics that he highlighted are probably the best. It was um, done by AgForward, a European project back in 2016, which estimated that 3.3% of the UK's utilisable agricultural area was under um, silver arable, silver pastoral or um, high value fruit production trees. However, this does exclude all traditional boundary hedgerows, wood pasture and parkland. Um, although the CAP was providing support for agroforestry, DEFRA didn't take up these options. Um, but from our own experience at the Woodland Trust with our Trees for Your Farm scheme, we know that the interest in, in, in agroforestry is growing significantly, albeit from a small base. Um, and as, to, as Colin alluded to at the beginning of the session, we are a partner of the uh, DEFRA-funded ELM test on agroforestry, which ORC are leading. And our initial evidence review highlighted that in the UK, uh, or in England, sorry, um, a lack of knowledge is a major barrier to farmers taking up agroforestry, followed closely by the need for advice, both technical um, uh, and um, practical, and for them to be encouraged to take up agroforestry as well as payment incentives. So at the moment, that's a bit of an ad hoc um, situation in terms of current support for agroforestry in the UK. Within the DEFRA Countryside Stewardship High Tier, there is good funding support for both the restoration, management and expansion of wood pasture, both in upland and, and lowland situations, although this will be phased out for new entrants by 2024. Um, the recently launched England Woodland Creation Offer uh, provides funding for narrower shelter belts and riparian buffers down to 10 metres in the hope that this will encourage farmers to take it up. In Scotland, they have a limited agroforestry scheme, which is um, for silver pastoral and schemes that need to be grazed by sheep. And again, in Wales, a small scale silver pastoral scheme, which um, meant land taken up had to be excluded from single farm payment and there was no funding for fencing. So these were significant um, disincentives to take up. Um, but as I said, the Woodland Trust has been running our own small trees for your farm. We call it a pilot scheme. It's funded through corporate money. So it's dependent on how much money we secure. And since it started in the 2013-14 season, we've helped create 160 schemes and planted about 200,000 trees but there's many more projects approved in the pipeline and we're already um, taking applications for next season, this season all being fully subscribed. We basically provide free advice and heavily subsidised trees and protection. So, you know, as we're probably all aware, we know that the state of biodiversity in the UK is very poor. I think we're the lowest in the G7 nations. Um, and the UK government, uh, you know, wants to be as to be in a situation of nature positive by 2030. Um, so focusing in on England, um, I think we need, really would love to hear and get a discussion going on what we feel the role of the new environmental land management policy in England will do in terms of um, rectifying 
the situation in terms of biodiversity. We know that ELM's overarching objectives is to use public money to deliver public goods, and obviously biodiversity is a key public good. Um, so how can ELM um, help achieve nature positive by 2030 and ensure biodiversity is on a positive footing going forward? We know, as I'm sure you're all aware, that ELM is based on three components, sustainable farming incentive, uh, which is only open to farmers, is designed around a set of standards where farmers will be paid for actions within their specific standards. We know that eight standards will be piloted this autumn, which includes a hedgerow standard and a farm woodland standard. And I'm delighted that I've been invited tomorrow to take part in a DEFRA workshop to hear more about their plans for an agroforestry standard and an opportunity to feed into that. And obviously the, the, the test that we're working on will also feed into that design. So we feel strongly that agroforestry has a role to play in SFI. Local nature recovery, the component two, is much more about collaboration between landowners. And I am assuming it's going to be a major delivery partner for the uh, local nature recovery strategies that each county will be developing. I think we have a lot less information on this, but it's expected to be options based, sort of taking on from the learnings from the countryside stewardship schemes um, and could well be competitive. And then finally, there's the landscape recovery component, uh, which is much more about land use change. It's project based on large scale. I think its projects are going to be between 500 and 5,000 hectares. But again, you know, I can see that certainly wood pasture type elements of agroforestry could easily have a role within this. The area that we don't seem to have a lot of information on, but will be key, is regulation. Obviously, we're going to be using, losing cross compliance as we come out of the common agricultural schemes and basic farm payment is phased out. Regulation will be key, and it will be key that it goes across all rural land use, not just uh, land that has entered into the environmental land management scheme. So I think there's a lot of work in terms of how we will regulate agroforestry, for example, within these new schemes. But there are other policy drivers. Um, as I've mentioned, ELM is likely to be a major delivery partner of the local nature recovery strategies that are being developed and piloted currently. Um, we know we were delighted to see that the Climate Change Committee report for um, net zero by 2050 highlighted that there should be at least a minimum of 10% of farm land converted to uh, silver arable or silver pastoral to help meet net zero by 2050. So again, you know, we know that if agroforestry is done in the right way, it will deliver for biodiversity and for carbon sequestration, and we need to tackle these two crises simultaneously. National Food Strategy highlighted the importance of agroecological farming and, and land for nature. Again, agroforestry is an important tool to help deliver that. Another one is the Clean Air Strategy. Uh, we know that the UK government has agreed to reduce ammonia emissions by 16% by 2030 against 2005 levels. And we know that farming is a significant um, contributor of the ammonia emissions. Um, so, you know, although farming and agroforestry have the uh, potential to really deliver positively for biodiversity at the same time without um, improvements in ammonia emissions, agriculture will do a lot of harm. So we know for a fact that over 90 percent of triple SIs exceed the critical um, levels for, that, for ammonia. But could trees be part of the solution? Um, we, you know, obviously the main main thing is to reduce the emissions but there will always be some residual and modeling by the uh, center for ecology and hydrology have shown the potential for trees to to help uh, reduce ammonia emissions the figures are up there but you know up to 60 percent for livestock ranging that's an effectively designed silver pastoral scheme in action there are other um, sources of potential funding for agroforestry biodiversity net gain is being developed in england um, it's, it's, it's much more than just it's going beyond harm to deliver benefits in response to um, agriculture uh, development. Um, biodiversity net gain can be applied to any land use change. So the standard will potentially include agricultural land as well. Um, the new biodiversity metric 3.0 will provide a way of measuring and accounting for nature losses and gains resulting from development or changes in land management. And there'll also be a small site metric, which might be better for farmers. 
Biodiversity net gain is a mandatory process. So any farmers can thinking about using it um, to help fund agroforestry will need to understand that the schemes will need to be transparent and traceable. Um, also, it would appear that the metric is wanting to incentivize the creation of quick to establish habitats, which possibly doesn't, <laughs> is not what trees are necessarily. And apparently wood pasture and parkland are considered to be technically challenging, rightly or wrongly. So there may be more scope for hedgerow creation or restoration and tree lines. But ultimately, you know, is this is biodiversity net gain realistically going to be uh, an incentive or a funding source to create trees on farms? Is it too complicated or is it an opportunity? Apparently, a consultation on biodiversity net gain implementation is going to be expected in the next few weeks. So it might be worth looking into that. But what about the role of the private sector? Will supply chains develop a market for biodiversity as they're doing for carbon and, um, and other ecosystem services? Um, the Council for Sustainable Business advises DEFRA on how businesses can help achieve uh, the aims of the 25-year environment plan. Um, they've produced a handbook called Nature um, uh, Handbook and gives practical advice on how businesses can help to address uh, and protect and restore nature as part of their business plans. There are lots of new companies setting up, and this is just one example, and I've just picked it out. Um, there's a landscape company who, are, who lists clients, it's Aviva and Network Rail, They've recently bought a farm in Essex and they're going to turn this into a research and training facility um, in meadow, hedgerow restoration, um, woodland creation. But an important part will be to develop an independently verifiable um, uh, and metric to build an, an accreditation certification program. So how can you actually measure all of this? And then just lastly, woodland eggs. Um, is, that a, is that an example, a good example of a supply chain uh, creating a premium market. And I'll just go on to talk a bit more about that and give you a bit of an example of a case study to finish. So we've worked very closely with David Brass, um, who's the chief executive of Lakes Free Range Egg Company, who was a real pioneer in the benefits of trees on free range hen units. Um, he started planting trees on his hen ranges probably nearly 20 years ago now. And we were both, obviously there's lots of evidence to say that these it gives them a farm a return on investment within six to 12 months um, because of the benefits to the hen's welfare and productivity. But he was interested, as we were, on the biodiversity benefits of this tree planting. It's 20% tree cover of a, uh, of a diverse mix of native species. So back in 2016, we identified nine sites, which are all based in Cumbria, which supply this business with free range eggs. And we had three sites that were very new. So trees were one to two years of age, three intermediate and three established sites. And on all nine sites for four consecutive years, we undertook three bird surveys and then a bat, butterfly, moth, ground vegetation and canopy cover survey. So the key results were that basically these trees were creating a really valuable woodland edge habitat. Lots of birds were found, including 12, which were on the red list. Lots of bats, common bats, who seem to actually love whipping up and down the lines of trees. Less butterflies, um, except those that really favoured sort of open woodland, woodland veg habitat. Lots and lots of moths, especially um, several threatened species. In terms of ground vegetation, obviously the management of that had the biggest impact, whether it was mowed or not. And perhaps the most important point is that we identified very quickly that structural diversity increases as the trees establish and then declines as trees mature and creates continuous cover. The other important fact was um, how the farms were positioned in the local landscape in terms of wildlife colonization of the ranges. The map on the left is of a new site. So the trees were only one to two years old when we started. But as you can see by the dark green shading, it had lots of other established habitat around it. It had far more biodiversity, both in terms of diversity and quantity, than the map on the right, which was an established site, but as you can see, in a very isolated position. So just to summarise, we were basically, the, wood, the, um, the planting on these free range hen ranges was just really creating a really valuable woodland edge habitat for wild, wildlife. It was most effective, it was part of a whole farm landscape approach. 
um, and you know benefited from having a broad mix of native tree species, which provided that diversity and resilience. Simple measures that farmers could undertake, but things like adding nesting and roosting box boxes to enhance breeding potential, etc., um, and therefore the biodiversity. But to maintain these benefits, it needed regular intervention. Once a, once a closed canopy appeared, then the benefits to both the hens and the biodiversity lessened. So just a final slide, really, just a few questions for when we come back and have a, a, a discussion, is that how can we incentivize biodiversity benefits of agroforestry? We know that management actions are required to maximize these benefits, but simultaneously they'll also deliver other ecosystem services and it can impact on the productivity of the business, both positively and negatively, but it needs resources. It needs farmers time, it needs farmers expertise um, and, and capital goods. So how should society reward farmers and land managers for this positive impact on biodiversity? Do we need targets? Do we need biodiversity targets? And can these be marketable services? What role does the private sector have? So hopefully that's just stimulated some good discussion for the, the latter part of this webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Helen. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, I, I guess one of the, one of the things that emerged from that is that uh, th this is a point made at the, the the Elm Test workshop the other week as well, and that's something I haven't given a lot of thought to, but uh, especially in particularly sensitive habitats, uh, you know, s slapping a bunch of commercial trees in there could be considered a bit, you know, a bit insensitive, a bit, a bit disruptive. I mean, uh, what, what do you what do you think of that? I mean, how should do you think that's 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 a concern that, that farmers uh, if if uh, say they, they have a, a, a sustainable farming incentive option for agroforestry, it, it could be used irresponsibly. Farmers might not, farmers must, might just plant those trees without considering uh, the suitability of the landscape context. That directed at me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, well, I think with all this, it needs a lot of. Um, knowledge and training we've identified that uh, you know and, and as Carolyn alluded to you know it's a it's a, a partnership between the farmer and other experts I think in lots of cases so I think given the right environment to do this then then the, the, the outputs will be positive but yeah we need to make sure there's not perverse incentive. Emma asks as well uh in these silver port, what, what types of trees do, do people tend to plant on these silver port, poultry farms? Do they, do, they, do they plant trees to provide additional products, you know, nuts, fruits, or, or do, they, do they not? In the, in the main, they've just been a, a, a mixture of native trees, primarily just for the, um, the, sh the shelter that they provided. So I think in some cases that when they thin them, obviously they'll use that usually probably for some wood biomass, wood fuel for internally on the, on the farm business. Some have started thinking about whether they could put the mix in of some fruit trees, et cetera, but then you're adding another layer of, of management requirements. So traditionally they've been um, mainly just native trees just for the services that they're delivering. They're not, not using the products. I mean, the big area I think that's increasingly interesting is the ammonia, because obviously even free range hens, they're quite large units. They are you know, very aware of the ammonia emissions they're producing. So that seems to be the next route is how do you adapt the planting design so that it can deliver the benefits it's already delivering in terms of hen welfare performance and biodiversity but act as a really important ammonia um, mitigation tool how do trees actually limit ammonia what's the mechanism can you explain that well i'm no scientist <laughs> but they basically they 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 capture it in through the you know through their leaves etc they basically act as a buffer so if you plant them downwind of your emissions um, or you know the treat the cattle and the sheep are grazing underneath them so they will there's different species have different abilities of absorbing so you need a diverse mixture and the field trials you know they've ex looked at having a backstop um, and then you allow a certain porosity will allow the the emissions to come up and through the trees and they capture I'm sorry, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, that's terrific. Uh, thanks, Hal. Uh, so I think we're going to have a break for 10 minutes now.
Uh, I think we'll reconvene it. Uh, it, said, it says on the schedule uh, 1520, but I think we'll go for 1525 uh, because we've run over by a few minutes. So if everyone can uh, reconvene at 325, we'll have a few general questions for the audience and hopefully we can get some some people off the mute to to follow up on, on questions and make it a little bit more interactive after the break. So we'll see you again at 15, uh, uh, 325. See you then.
Well, again, everyone, uh, we are fresh after the break. So we now we have, uh, well, as long as it lasts, uh, maximum 50 minutes uh, for a bunch of general questions that you've, you've asked the panel for them to reply. And the people that have asked them, I'll give you an opportunity to come back on, unmute and, and maybe follow up uh, to get a bit of chat going here. So let's see what we have here. Uh, First is uh, another question from, from Bill Grayson, who's, who's a, a well-known conservation agriculturalist, well-known guy. He asks, uh, this is a general question for the panel, is there a tension between pasture management actions and agroforestry actions and the sustainable farming incentive? Because, of course, a pasture management standard has been released and to the... Uh, the knowledge of, of the panel is there likely to be conflicts between these two standards of, of an agroforestry standard is released. Anybody care to pick up on that one within the panel? Um, well, I can go first if you like. Um, yeah, it's a good question, Bill, and I'm hoping that tomorrow we might find a bit more because, as you say, um, we've got these different standards. Um, for example, the, uh, the grassland standards do include uh, some sort of protection for infield trees, you know, as in, you know, your classic um, single infield tree. So I'm guessing that if there was an agroforestry standard that just sat alongside um, the other standards, then, you know, if your land was agroforestry, it would be in that standard and there would be actions in there towards the grassland part of it. I can't, you know, otherwise it's going to get very complicated. We've already got hedgerow standard, which in a sense is a boundary agroforestry standard, but for it would need to be a standard for silver pastoral that looked at the trees in the field and the pasture in the one, wouldn't it? So I'm not sure. What, what do you think, Bill? <laughs> uh, I think, but I think Bill had to leave at three, unfortunately. Oh. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if anyone else in the panel has anything to say about that. I, I think it's very difficult to when you know, you've got, as you say, hedgerow, grassland, agroforestry, just splitting everything into um, compartments. It's uh, the thing about um, land is that it all interacts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we, we do like to sort of classify things, but there are no straight lines and no, no sharp edges. I don't know how you cope with that, but anyway, just, just a little point. Okay. Excellent. And maybe one, one thing, Colin, is that, um, you know, and I don't know, this is just off the top of my head, but maybe agroforestry standard in, in, in SFI has to be additional options to the existing standards. That could be the other way, because you've obviously got silver arable, which will have a similar situation with the arable standard. So maybe they are options on top of the existing standards. Okay. Thanks. Uh, this this question is, is one I think a lot of people think of uh, when it comes to agroforestry. It's a kind of a basic fundamental question. So uh, this is from Andrew Count, uh, Cuthbert, and I, I think works, uh, works for DEFRA. What species of trees are best to plant fruit trees of timber production? So you're a farmer in the north of England, you're a farmer in the south of England, you're a farmer in central England, whatever. Different types of soil, different ecosystems. How do you choose the tree that's right for you? Maybe we could start with Caroline because uh, you, you know you're the farmer. What considerations would you take into account when you're choosing a, choosing a tree? Can you think of maybe if you were planning to exploit these commercially as well? Yeah. <laughs> Where am I? Right. So I would say you, you've got to have um, a plan, as it were. So. Uh, is are your trees going to be do you want the shade do you want them to be straight up and just windbreaks as in poplar trees planted in various parts of the country as windbreaks to uh, shelter tree orchards so you you, you know you, you choose your tree according to what you want it to do uh, you might want some nitrogen fixing uh, tree put your alders in um, or do you want it to produce fruit as well so, and what kind of fruit tree will bear in your climate? So, I, you know, this is, this is where the, the, your specialist um, 
advisors come in. Talk to a forestry man if you want to um, produce uh, wood. Uh, if you want you know, quick growing uh, trees which will produce wood, you could plant eucalyptus. But it, you know, it's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. But it will yield fire, firewood and it will coppice and it'll yield timber for for um, uh, for construction as well. If you saw it quick. So there's lots, you know, lots of different considerations to take into account. And if you want, yeah, as you want to grow fruit, uh, I come from North Yorkshire, um, change counties now. And uh, up there, there's a, a little village on the moors called Appleton Lee Moors. And in the past, everybody planted trees, apple trees in their hedgerows. And they're still there today. It's, uh, it's laid out on a um, old, um, medieval layout and behind every farm is the garth and then in, down into the, its fields and along quite a lot of those fields the hedgerows you will find apple trees still bearing today so there's nothing new uh, but it's an extraordinary place to find apple trees North York Moors there you go but they knew and uh, so that's the answer to that there's no straight answer depends what you want them to do and, uh, you know, if you're interested in growing apples, because there's a lot of work in that and expertise. That's it. <laughs> no straight answer. <laughs> you're muted, Colin. How about soil type? Is this a big issue? for? Oh, yes. Yes. The uh, foresters always say right tree in the right place. So you Tell can... us about what, what types of trees, trees will grow in growing different types of soils. Mm hmm. Do you know, could you tell us a bit about that? Ah, well, if you've got really wet soils, uh, you need something like alders or willows, um, which you can, again, you can use as, as a, well, alders you can use as a firewood crop or as a, um, a pretty timber crop. Um, willows uh, are in our silver pasture project because they are very good um, browse for your cattle. The cattle love them turn them into a field and they don't go for the grass first, they go for the willows around the hedges. So, and there are other species that you can use for um, fodder crops. We're gonna find out what really gets eaten when, uh, when our silver pasture plots are up. Uh, that's part of the um, aim of the whole project. Yeah. Um, uh, cattle are reputed to eat holly. I've never seen them do it, but uh, there's holly in that mix. Uh, so yeah, if, Dry, drier, drier, solid soils. You could plant oaks. You could plant, you know, I think a mixture is a good thing. And you'll end up with your, 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 um, your, your standard hedgerow trees. So, um, you know, oaks, ash, but you're not allowed to plant at the moment. <laughs> um, elms, uh, mm. if you can get them, or um, sycamores, but they'll get eaten by the squirrels. That's the, the other other thing. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, species of tree. Ask a forester. Yeah. How about uh, how about sort of things issues like commodity prices? You know, right. are, are prices are they stable or are they unstable? Or uh, you know, because uh, agroforestry and planting trees is a long term endeavour, but I would imagine commodity prices tend to be fairly volatile, don't they? Ah, uh, yep. Yeah. At the moment. Um, I mean, the UK is short of, of construction timber. It's going to be short of construction timber um, in the future because we're this uh, veer away from conifer plantations. So I would plant conifers yeah. mixed in with other things, and then you have a crop. And you know, good construction conifers, larch or um, Douglas, red cedars, depends on your soil and the exposure. Um, if you've got a soggy ground, you grow Sitka spruce. Uh, so you know, you you if you're looking at it as a as a as a commodity, or then there's the the, the biomass option. Uh, there's some very fast growing um, willow, uh, which you just you, you go in every five years and and coppice it off and sell it to your biomass thing. I'm not quite sure what happened to that project. There was there was quite a big thing about it about uh, nine ten years ago, and it seems to all have gone quiet. 
because people ended up with these stands of willow and, uh, and alder and no biomass plants near them. So you need to do your research because it's a big thing, planting trees. Okay. Does anyone uh, else on the panel have anything to say about what, what, would they, what would they consider if they're choosing a tree on their particular site? Just add a few general comments. Um, one is that diversity is very important and certainly the evidence would show that if you're, um, I completely agree with Carolyn, it's all about what your objectives are. So if one of your key objectives is biodiversity, then you need a diversity of tree species and you need to look what grows well in your local area. Um, uh, but again, it's all about what your objectives are. And there'll, you'll, there'll be more than one, but you need to have a really clear idea of what your primary objective is and your secondary objectives um, so that you choose the right species um, and the right design. And another point would just be to say about biosecurity. Um, you know, Callan's mentioned ash dieback. Um, it's going to be absolutely important that we're really, really strong on biosecurity. So therefore, we would always advocate that you plant seeds that have been collected and grown in the UK to try and reduce the risk of introducing more tree disease. It's taking wonder, a look what's growing around your area and be very clear about what you're trying to achieve. I wonder if Tom might like to uh, answer. Uh, I, I was wondering about the issue of locally adapted genotypes. Do you think this is, this is important, Tom? Or? Yeah, well, I, I think... As, as Helen said, diversity is the is the key, particularly moving into a um, a changing climate. Um, the more diversity you have, the the more you're hedging your bets against the un the uncertainty um, in terms of future climate. Um, but also, just to go back to to tree selection, um, and so the the sites we were studying were all based around mostly based around fruit trees. Um, which we're finding arable farmers in this country um, seem to be favouring um, these fruit trees, particularly because they can be grown on root stocks to limit their height. Um, and I, I suppose one of the, the main issues with agroforestry and arable farming in this country in particular is, um, is light competition, so it's shading out the crops. Um, so they seem to be a good option, these uh, fruit trees on, on root stocks. Uh, to limit their height, therefore limit the, the shade impact. Um, and also going back to what we were saying about price. Um, so we, we recently published a paper actually looking at the farm income from uh, agroforestry systems based around intercropping apple trees with cereal crops. Um, and as part of that, we did a, a sensitivity analysis. So by that, I mean, we looked at the factors which have the greatest impact on farm income. So we looked at factors like yield of the arable crop, yield of the tree crop, yield uh, sorry, price of the tree crop, uh, price of the arable crop. Um, and the biggest factor was the price of the, of the apples of the tree crop. Um, so yeah, it's, in order to this, for this to be a profitable system, that's really critical was identifying a, a good market. Um, so some farmers um, makes heritage juice products out of their apples and then sell them locally, they get, they get a really good price uh, for their trees that way. Um, yeah, so that's, that's really critical to, to farm income and making it work economically as well as ecologically. Do you think it's, uh, I've heard the opinion that, you know, farmers having their own their, their own farm shop, for example, or their own business where they can sell these apples is probably the best way to do it rather than putting them on the general market. Do you, do you agree with that? Well, well, I do, yeah, and I'm sure others will have thoughts on that. But, um, yeah, certainly uh, two of our study sites we looked at do have their own farm shops and, yeah, going direct to customer with a high-quality heritage juicing product, for example, with the apples, um, seems to be a really good option and I think, they can get a much better price doing that than going wholesale. Mm. Um, yeah, there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, people, farmers growing nut trees and uh, agro, agro uh, agroforestry in the UK. Do you think that's going to take off? Or? Anybody? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, anybody. <laughs> Go for it, Tom. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say. I think um, it's. 
it's it's an interesting avenue of uh, avenue of research. Um, I don't think those systems have been particularly well studied and in terms of research. It's mostly been around timber, and then more recently looking more at the apple and fruit trees. Um, so yeah, maybe others have thoughts on the potential for that. I think um, with the changing um, dietary requirements and the, you know, the positive nature that nuts can have on, on being a UK grown source of a healthy, nutritious product, then, then I think it's something that needs to be looked into seriously. I agree with Tom, it's not something that's been studied or there is much of in the UK. Um, but certainly some of the farmers we're talking to with the more innovative ones are certainly thinking ahead. And if you look at the, you know, the food strategy, um, and if you start to try and link um, to, to convince Treasury that they need to continue to support environmental land management, then we need to make those links between what the farm can deliver in terms of environmental services and health and a healthy society. Um, so you would think that nut production should have a future. Um, but yeah, I'm no expert in it. But yeah, certainly farmers are starting to think about it. Yeah, Andrew Cuthbertson. Uh, we used to know each other a long time ago. Could you unmute yourself and, and maybe uh, could you give your opinion on, on this? That would be great if, you, if you're able, if you're still here. Uh, I had a little bit of interruption there actually coming through. Just repeat what, what you want to say. I just wondered if you had any opinion feedback on what the, the panel have said about, uh, about, your, about your question about which tree choice. Well, I don't know. It's just, it was just me generally thinking myself as to what the best tree choice is. I've done a little bit of work myself in agroforestry, and I was just looking at ash and sycamore, but those were being grown for timber production, uh, for like hockey sticks and things like that. Uh, but obviously, you're waiting on like a, um, it was a 20, 30 year sort of return on that before they're big enough to produce that. So that's sort of where it's just coming from. Like, do you think it's better to go for a, like a fruit tree production or the timber production aspect, and which is sort of the last? the West less labor intensive, I suppose the timber production would be, would that be correct? Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah, it would work, yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you, but I mean, you need to keep an eye on them, but uh, yeah, you just got to plant them, which is hard work. Um, mm. And uh, yes, yes, the, because there aren't going to be that many more ash uh, left for the hurling sticks. So yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's a, a market at the moment. But, uh, yeah, it's quite a complex trade-off there, isn't there? Between like uh, fruit trees will give you a fairly a fairly uh, turn fairly soon, but they take a lot of management, so labour costs are higher. Mm -hmm. uh, timber trees will take a longer time to grow to give you the returns, but they have lower they have lower labour requirements. So the, you can see how complicated the, the economics of these systems then become, you know. So. I think just to add on that as well, it becomes really dependent on the individual business model and the individual farm. So some of the farmers that we've been working with who have created silver arable schemes based on apples, largely for the reasons that have already been given, find that um, it actually allows them to maximise their um, labour force by giving the, the typical arable um, staff work to do in the winter months. So they can spread the pruning of the apple trees out as a task to do in the winter. Um, so yeah, but that's, it's, that's a decision based on an, every individual farm business is different. Um, so I think it's a really important point to think about is to, you know, the, the implications on staffing, but can that be turned into a positive or is it a, an additional mm. strain? Thanks, thanks, excellent. Uh, so I've got a question from Eleanor Litabarski. Uh, this uh, kind of applies to, you know, the, these type of arable orchard systems I showed at the start. I mean, uh, she's asked, is there a limit to the amount of trees that can be used before you encounter diminishing returns for crops? Because, I mean, you could hypothetically plant your, you know, your, your orchard trees within your, within your cereal at extreme high density, but then uh, that would start to impact crop. Uh, production, so there's a bit of a trade-off there. So, is there a is is there a limit to tree density? When does that stop? When you're designing a system, when do you when do you limit tree density? And what what is that? What is the figure? Anybody? 
I'm again, I'm no, no expert, but it's obviously the you know, silver arable system. You're usually considering um, the alley width, um, so the area you've got in between the rows of trees for growing your your arable crop. Um, obviously, the spacings within the row, if it's a single row, although it's not necessarily always a single row, will be dependent on the type of tree you're planting and the product you're trying to get from. So obviously, the spacings will be different for timber as opposed to apple. But my understanding is that obviously the alley width will have a big impact, plus the type of tree in your row on when the shade and shelter will start to impact negatively on your cereal crop. And certainly some systems are planned to evolve over time from a silver arable to a silver pastoral scheme. So when the trees are, are bigger, and, you know, especially if they're timber trees, then you turn it into a silver pastoral scheme where you're perhaps either grazing through with electric fencing or you're conserving the grass and you're not expecting so much productivity from your alley um, because you're about to start or already starting to harvest timber trees. What, what about, uh, maybe Tom could answer, what, what about uh, what about diseases and pests and tree density? Does that become a, is that something you should you should be taking into account as well? How, how does that affect uh, disease transmission and stuff, the density of trees? Yeah, so I, we looked at we looked at pest distributions across across crop alleys adjacent to tree rows, um, and there's not, there's not a lot of strong effects in terms of there, there does seem to be a, a big spillover of the um, species which are in the tree rows into the crop alleys, um, and this was looking at twenty four meter wide crop alleys. Um, so, yeah, I mean in terms of pests, um, twenty four meter wide seems to seems to work well um, in terms of uh, well, and, and in terms of the beneficial insects as well moving out into the crop alleys um, and yeah I mean the problem is we haven't studied other alley widths so it's quite difficult to compare um, you know people ask what well, if we double it to 48 meters um, would that be would that be better um, so yeah I think it's we also we also look at the yield of the crop um, of the cereal crops across the crop alleys, um, and uh, we did find that on average the yields tend to be higher in the centre of the alley compared to the edge next to the trees. Um, but there's a lot of year-to-year -year variation, and it seems to interact with the weather a lot. Um, and in some cases, actually, the yield was higher next to the trees, um, and we haven't quite figured out why that is. It's probably some stabilised microclimate going on and it, it depends on you know, rain rainfall patterns um, so um, so yeah it I think um, to some to some extent there will be diminishing returns but um, it's it's a complex area and it interacts with weather a lot as well within roses is it a bad idea to have the trees too dense touching each other and stuff like that or how do you space them within rows or what's the best? What's the optimum space? And yeah. well, I, th I think that would depend on the tree, really. So, um, in in the study in the systems we're looking at, they're uh, they're about three meters apart, I think, um, which is um, so they're just about touching each other, um, but there's not too much competition between trees. Um, but it will depend. It, it will depend entirely, I think, on on what tree you choose to grow and, and rootstock. Okay. Thanks. Uh, the uh, does uh, was it was it Eleanor? The could you um, would you like to unmute yourself and, and reply to these, or is there anything else you'd like to ask, Eleanor? Hello, Eleanor. And Eleanor's maybe gone. Are you there, Eleanor? No. Okay. Uh, no. I was just going to comment on the. Uh... The uh, silver pastoral um, uh, plots which we've planted, that we've planted at three metre centres mm -hmm. um, and we expect to have to thin. I'm sure that the, um, uh, the animals will do a bit of thinning for us. But looking at, I have some little bits of wood pasture that's been, uh, you know, over the years, bits of woodland have been left in pasture and um, they've, they've thinned them out to about five meter centers. So that's interesting, but there isn't any light coming through. So in a silver pasture 
um, system, you need a certain amount of light to come through your canopy so that your grass grows. Mm. So there is something there for the animals to eat, um, at least in the spring before they trample it all. But with bigger, bigger, bigger um, areas, then, you know, it's good to have your grass growing all the time. So horses for courses, okay. trees for places. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kirsty Brannan asks, uh, this is a, a, a difficult question. What potential conflicts can you see emerging between the various objectives that agroforestry can help deliver? For example, between timber production, biodiversity, carbon, livestock, shelter, and how should regulation and incentives minimize those conflicts? Well, I think we've perhaps, we've perhaps started the discussion on this, haven't we, by saying that you need to be really clear about what your primary objectives are for the design of your agroforestry scheme. So, yes, we all know that agroforestry can help deliver all those things and more in that list. Um, but I think when you're designing your scheme, you need to have your primary objective and your secondary objective um, to understand those potential conflicts uh, and um, interactions. Um, you know, I, and I think, you know, as I alluded to in my presentation, I think regulation is the, perhaps the big unknown, undiscussed element to a lot of this. Um, if you think that, you know, if you were designing an ag agroforestry scheme where the um, carbon sequestration element was important because you were hoping to offset your own farm emissions, but also to market the carbon, then potentially the, um, the regulation um, for those trees will be different to if you're doing a, a silver arable scheme with apple tree production, because obviously for it to, to be able to sequester the carbon and feasible to market that, there needs to be some element of permanency in the system. Whereas I think the silver arable schemes that Tom's been highlighting in my mind, perhaps look more like long-term ag ag agricultural rotations. Um, so I think, yeah, it's it's the old thing with agroforestry. It's very very complex, um, and no one design fits all. Which I think is why how it's going to be regulated is going to be challenging. And and maybe one way would be to relate the regulation and the guidelines to the outputs that a, a particular scheme is going to be delivering. So the carbon will be different to. Can, can you tell me exactly what you mean by regulation surrounding agroforestry? Well, uh, I, it's an open question. I, you know, it, it, because it's new, then elements of agroforestry come under forestry regulation. Um, but, you know, if we're going to have a sort of land use category of agroforestry in a more formal way that's supported by policy and government funding, then I think there's elements of it that, regulation we don't quite know you know are our agroforestry schemes going to need eias for example as woodland creation schemes do will that really put off farmers from even ever considering it so no i certainly don't claim to know all the issues or all the problems but i think it's something that needs to be really looked into very quickly as um elm is developed in england and in the other devolved countries to to support and encourage agroforestry which is obviously great um, but farmers and land managers are need, going to need to understand what 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 the what the payment incentives potentially are, both from government and the private sector. But importantly, what regulation they might have to adhere to. Does anyone else in the panel have anything to say about about that about the the conflicts between the various objectives of of well, agroforestry? Well, I think I think that. Um, if it goes back to the fact you've got to decide what, you, what you're going for. And if you're going for carbon fixing, then you grow construction timber in your agroforestry. So that having locked up the carbon, it then stays locked up when you use it for construction. Um, it's one, one comment, but it is all about deciding what you want to do. And everybody will be different. Okay, uh, Kirsty. Uh, are you are you around? Would you like to uh, develop that question or, or reply to the panel members? Um, hi, Colin. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for dealing with that um, uh, uh, question. Um, I do appreciate your thoughts. Um, 
Yeah, I think you're totally right. It, it, it will depend on the individual's priorities, won't it? But it does highlight some of the, the challenges, as you say, with, with the systems that we currently have um, being split between those that are based on farmland and those that are based on um, forestry and woodland um, can sometimes generate some, some challenges for, for us on the ground. Um, so opportunities to propose better systems going forward. Okay. Uh, so uh, we, we, we had an earlier question. I'm not sure uh, where it came from. It was on uh, the feasibility. Uh, what's the opinion of, the, of the, the panel on the feasibility of biodiversity net gain, this idea of, of actually bringing, of actually delivering biodiversity gains? Uh, I don't know if Helen knows most knows most about this idea. Does it seem realistic? Is it going to work? Or do, you got, do you have anything to say on that? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not sure that I have much more to add. I think it's um, it's obviously in development. Um, Can you tell us a bit about it, what you know about it? It's not someone I'm hugely familiar with, I must admit. Well, the, the area, I, you know, I, this is England focused, um, I think, um, in Scotland and Wales, they're observing and looking as to what they might do. But yeah, it, it's my understanding. And, you know, this is from limited, limited and not co a colleague involvement in it really, rather than me. Um, it's all about doing more, more than just uh, offsetting the harm. It's actually doing good. It's going to be a mandatory process. Um, so if, you know, the understanding is obviously the developer ideally um, mitigates any harm with doing good at the site that they're developing, the next best option is locally. And then obviously I think the idea is that for those that can't be done there, there'll be like a national portfolio of sites that, that, that developers can then fund activity on. Um, so I suppose, you know, the, the, the question is, is whether this, would be able to fund agroforestry, is it a source of funding? Um, so could a farmer say, right, I want to get my agroforestry scheme funded by a developer who needs to, can't offset on their development site, nor locally, and, you know, and I become one of these projects that gets funded. Although I'm really not sure of the detail of all this. Um, but it, you know, it's a mandatory process, so then it becomes a, uh, you know, it has to be a traceable and scheme and therefore it will mean I assume it has some element of permanency to it um, you know it's not something that could just be put in for a few years and then put out um, and I don't understand I'm not familiar with it enough or even know if the details are there in terms of how easy it will be due to do for, for tree planting because of this indication that they want to think habitats that create quite quickly um, and trees are less so um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, yeah, it, it might be more suitable for simpler things like, you know, hedgerow boundary agroforestry or simple lines. But, yeah, I, you know, I'm afraid I don't know much more about it than that. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else does who's on the, on the call. Um, and we may find out more when they, when they issue their consultation on it about how it might be implemented. So it's still very much in the design process as far as I'm aware. Carolyn, Tom, do you know anything more about this? Um, yeah, the, the, the offsetting, I've been approached to plant stuff on my land um, to offset uh, harm done by reopening uh, a railway line. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the land to do it. It was quite a good deal. <laughs> um, okay. But, yeah, I mean, it does, it does happen. Um, but, you know, as, as to uh, if there's going to be a biodiversity gain, yes, but people need, to, it needs to be done on a landscape scale so that there is actually somewhere for things to come from and to go to. Uh, you know, in, in, a, in, in, in a particular farm, you can operate on, on, on your own, but unless you're a huge place and do big rewilding or whatever, uh, like Nep Castle, and, and have, um, a, you're, you're close enough to other places to get an, an ingress of, uh, of, uh, of species. Then you, you you know you you can put all the stuff there, but unless there's a, a passageway to get to you, then uh, your wildlife isn't going to come. Um, okay. I'm just thinking of, of uh, my little willow tits who are a bit stymied on on crossing open space. They don't cross more than 
50 or 20 to 50 meters of open space. They can't fly across any, any longer pl place. So they have to have hedgerows and, and uh, bits of woodland to fly between. Okay. Uh, we, thanks. We, we have a Piers Sangen who seems to know a little bit about this. Would you like to say something on this issue, Piers? Hi, uh, yeah, okay, so I can't say overly much because um, I'm an ecologist based in Jersey Channel Islands, but I keep an eye on uh, biodiversity net gain. Um, and I work as an advisor for um, our local farmers for LEAF. So agroforestry keeps coming up and tree planting comes up a lot for over here. Um, one of the things I'm not quite sure how it would work is if where you said funding could come from biodiversity net gain, if for planting a straight woodland, it may be acceptable if it's, except if it's building onto woodland, but at the point that it might trigger in itself an environmental assessment and requiring development, I'm not sure if you can then um, basically cause a chain reaction of needing biodiversity net gain going across. Um, so I'm not quite sure how the powers to be would actually view that. Um, it, it could be an interesting one to trial out, um, but I'm not really sure. I also think they may be queried if the agroforestry is then going to be a commercial product, whether that in itself would be um, falling within what they're looking for in biodiversity net gain, um, which they've got quite fixed criteria for, for improving habitat. Now, something like hazel and willow may have an exception because obviously coppicing is of exceptional benefit, but planting fruit trees, nut trees and conifers, probably less so. Um, it would be very interesting one to see if you could get an output from biodiversity net gain, but I think it would be very specific um, actual uh, situations where it may work. Otherwise, I'm not sure they would go for it. Okay, thanks. That was uh, an interesting input. Uh, could... Uh... Could uh, I, I'm not sure I fully understood this question, but could could Jake Freestone uh, unmute and and ask his questions about drainage schemes and agroforestry systems for fruit and nut trees? Brilliant, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, no, we, we've got um, some arable fields that we're looking at exploring agroforestry on, and one of them's got um, some field drainage underneath, and I'm just inquiring as to what the panel's feelings about um, the routes intercepting and causing uh, those drainage systems to um, effectively be made redundant, i.e. filled up with roots, or whether we can use specific trees that are uh, quite shallow rooted. I mean, the draining schemes are about sort of 60 centimetres down. Um, in an ideal world, we'd probably want to try and plant them in between the sort of laterals so the impact is reduced and the land drainage is where the crops will be grown but um that might not be practical depending on the different angles that we need to have a look at so that was my question really thank you does anyone on the panel have anything to say about that that's a real practitioner's question uh <laughs> i lost I lost, I lost, I lost the last bit. But basically, can you plant trees on drainage system? Hmm. Yeah. Choose something with shallower roots that isn't very thirsty. Get get advice from your local forestry pe people. Uh, where whereabouts are you, Jake? Um, this bit's just in Worcestershire. Um, okay. So um, yeah, one field's got drainage underneath it. One hasn't. Um, we're looking at fruit trees and some nut trees because we're sort of historically um, apple pear sort of territory. But I think nuts wow. have got a, I think nuts have got a good future. Um, and again, I totally agree with the sort of diversity message that's come across from today's meeting. All of these different species all have different benefits to the wider environment. So, um, yeah, that's what we're looking at, really. Yeah, I still have my doubts about nuts, really. Um, personally, that um, there's never has been a big nut growing industry in this country. 
uh, partly because you, you, you'll need a good gun to get the squirrels. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I would plant fruit and nut trees and hedge your bets. Oh, yes. Sorry, Carol. That's what we're planning on doing. Yes. A mi mixed species, basically, up, up the rows. Lovely. Yeah. And some um, and some sort of shrubs for livestock grazing as well. We've currently got sheep. We're looking at cattle. Um, so a sort of browsy grazing thing when the arable rotation is uh, in sort of grass in those fields, really. Yeah. Thanks, Graphic. Don't uh, plant willow. <laughs> no, I don't know. I'm going to try and avoid willow for the for the drains, really. Um, yeah. yeah, they'll go for your drains. Yeah. yeah. You know, sorry. Sorry. Continue, Caroline. Sorry. Or, or you can plant things like um, elder, elder, elderberries, another diverse fruit crop, and I suspect, suspect yeah. that, the, and, and they're not too palatable to cattle because they'll eat your fruit trees. Yes, they will. <laughs> browse, That's the problem. Those, mixing, yeah. mixing cattle, sheep are better because they're shorter, mm. but they go for the bark. Bitter experience. That is, yeah. yeah. Okay. Do geese, geese, geese are good. Geese, yeah. I thought chickens <laughs> for eggs. No, no, um, geese. delicious woodland, woodland eggs, but um, yeah, in yeah, interesting. I hadn't thought of ducks. Uh, <laughs> geese, geese. <laughs> <laughs> ducks could eat the slugs as well, then. Oh yeah, ducks. Yeah, ducks are good for slugs. <laughs> can I can I just say that uh, Stephen Briggs, who's a well-known agroforestry farmer, has had issues with 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 roots interfering with rain. I, I don't think it's been an issue for him, but uh, he's somebody yeah. you might like yeah. contact. who's an expert in this area. He's he's dealt with that issue and, and got over it. I think, and uh, if it's if it's lateral spread of roots, I think they they do stuff like severing roots. Uh, at the side of the trees, so the roots don't spread laterally and they, and they spread downwards. So uh, that's that's something you could do. But I would recommend you talk to somebody like Stephen. He can give you advice on that. Yeah, there's a there's a nice comment from uh, Sophie Mott. It says uh, plant them plant them away from drains and then subsoil along the lines to uh, direct the roots down rather than out. There you go. I'm sure you've got a spoiler. Stephen essentially just takes a knife along the side of, of, of each tree and cuts the roots so they don't grow that laterally, they grow down. Yeah? That's how he manages the, the roots to make sure they, they stay, that they grow down. Oh, yeah, and uh, yeah, thanks, Sophie, for that comment. Uh, it, Sophie says, if it helps from what I've seen, it doesn't appear to be a problem. Plant away from drained subsoil annually along the lines to direct the roots down rather than out. When the drains are full in winter, there's enough water around. The trees aren't looking for more water in the summer when they are uh, drains. Uh, when the drains are dry, so not drawing the roots in. But uh, yeah, uh, people like Stephen Briggs can help you with that. Uh, we're kind of reaching the end, so I, I wanna, I wanna, I'd like to ask each each panel member, you know, a sort of summing up comment. Uh, I want you each each panel member to ref reflect on how agroforestry can contribute contribute towards the conservation or restoration and biodiversity, and what is the priority within Elm to enable this to happen. So, panel members, I would like each to have a think about. It. I'm sorry about that, but I am gonna. <laughs> okay. Summing up. Okay, I've got the simplest task. <laughs> Do you want me to talk? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Okay, so yes, it can support biodiversity and uh, it can do it very well, but you need to have a landscape scale um, plan to know what to encourage in each area and, and to have a bigger, a, a bigger view on uh, what, what's, what's going on. Uh, you also need to have the advice and the support for farmers to do this and the funding. They need, they, they need some extra dosh to do it, definitely. Uh, Helen uh, or Tom? Well, I mean, I would just, yeah, I mean, obviously we need really clear advice, support and funding. Um, 
And I agree with Carolyn's point of view about at the very least, it needs to be a whole farm approach, <clears throat> um, ideally a landscape approach. Um, and I think one of the challenges, as, as we've always talked about, is regulation, but is also how you measure the benefits that, that, that the actions are delivering. So, you know, ideally, ELM was designed to, to reward farmers for the outputs, the, the environmental services that they were delivering. <laughs> Um, SFI seems to be being paying the action. So I think there's lots of work on how um, that we can get to that point where farmers have the flexibility to farm in a way that suits their business, but they can measure <clears throat> with good baseline recordings what they're actually delivering in terms of public goods and then get reward and get paid for those, those services. Um, I think there's not more work that needs to be done on that whole farm approach and being able to take an assessment of the whole farm in terms of its natural assets and what issues it's got on it. You know, has it got issues of soil erosion, for example, or whatever? So what's the potential? What's the actual existing already positive natural assets and where are the issues so that you design a scheme that really takes it all in its entirety um, rather than just piecemealing bits off and thinking, we'll do this bit here and this bit there. We need to have a much more holistic approach. Tom, cool. thanks, Phil. Yeah, so um, from a research perspective, um, as I've summarised earlier, really, there's really good, more and more evidence coming through that agroforestry can be, is a really important tool in um, promoting biodiversity and bringing biodiversity back to farmland. And that includes uh, elements of biodiversity which are important for sustainable farming and resilient farming into the future. So, for example, by promoting the natural the device diversity of natural enemy communities, which then help to um, suppress pests, and that's really important going forward into the future, into a changing climate where we're not sure about what new pests might might emerge. So it's really important that we're prepared for that, and also through wild pollinators. Um, so agroforestry can really can really help with that, and to reduce our reliance on uh, managed pollinators like honeybees. So agroforestry, I think, can play a really key role um, uh, as one tool, along with so many other diversified farming systems like cover cropping, like organic farming. Um, it's one really important tool, I think, going forward um, in terms of sustainable agriculture. Um, and I think just to, just to finish, a key word which has popped up many times today has been that word diversity. A diversity of trees and diversity of agroforestry systems um, and so in terms of policy I think it's really important that the policy reflects that it allows it reflects that diversity of agroforestry systems and it gives room for farmers to innovate and to try new things um, and so that we can see um, whether they're whether they're going to work or not um, and it allows farmers to experiment and innovate with um, different practices. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. Now, uh, Bill Grayson, who uh, who's very knowledgeable in this area, uh, who's he's had to he had to leave at some point. But I wonder if you'd like to come in and say anything, Bill, at the end here. Um, yes, thanks, Colin. Um, so my 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 question before about the um, the problems if you're trying to make an application under the SFI trial. Um, on an individual field parcel that contains woodland and grassland. And the response I got was that you can only have one of them, which quite, quite shocked me because <laughs> I thought we were approaching this new era where DEFRA were beginning to understand that life is more complicated than that. I just wondered if anybody else had um, come across this seemingly impenetrable barrier. Panel? Helen, do you have anything to say on yeah, that? Yeah, well, I mean, obviously I'm not practically doing it, um, Bill, as you know, but I think the message we get back from DEFRA is that the, the eight standards um, that are being piloted are not, you know, the whole idea of SFI I'm hoping still is that it's based on a whole farm plan but in terms of the pilot they were just getting out some initial standards and therefore it wasn't looking at it in the context of a whole farm plan 
Um, and I, I, you know, I agree with your concerns completely. And when I think you were perhaps offline when we had a go at answering this question before. Um, and, you know, I think they are, they are obviously developing um, the potential of an agroforestry standard and hopefully we'll find out more tomorrow what that might look like. But obviously an agroforestry standard if for a silver pastoral scheme or a silver arable scheme is only going to work if it incorporates the grassland or the arable land in between the trees and whatever format that are, whether that's wood pasture or rows of trees. So it, it is going to cause complexity to what they've got as a star, uh, this SFI at the moment. So it goes back to that need of needing that whole farm plan approach. And I did say at the time, Bill, earlier, Maybe, and this is just uh, throwing this out there, um, one answer might be that agroforestry doesn't have its own standard. It's, uh, it's an optional part of the other standards because, you know, otherwise, as you say, if you've got a grassland standard, you, you know, you, how does that work with a, with a wood pasture scheme? So I think there's lots and lots of um, problematical bits to get over um, before we can get because of the complexity of agroforestry. Um, Perhaps I, so in, 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 in making the, the application, you know, obviously it, it, was, it was set up as a trial. Mm. And, and so it, it clearly has sort of just rolled on from the old BPS. Mm. So for each field, you have a map, which uh, is, is the standard map that the RPA use. And it shows what used to be known as eligible area under basic payment. And then the other areas in that land parcel that were deemed ineligible and more than, well, usually most of that, those ineligible areas <laughs> in my case would be woodland. So I'd, I'd assumed that, you know, it would be a simple matter of the area of eligible land under the old BPS was the grazable area i.e. the grassland, mm -hmm. and the area that was ineligible was the woodland, and that would be, but they, they haven't even accepted that, that, that way of thinking, which I thought corresponded nicely with, with um, what, what we'd had up to now. But, but obviously, I, I'm, I'm not that concerned about it yet, because this is the trial, yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. hoping that in the course of it rolling out, the feedback I can give will help them to um, uncomplicate it. <laughs> but I, I don't, I, you know, I, I guess I was looking to, 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 to this group to help me with, with that process, to, to you know, feed me some ideas and some ways of dealing with these people that will facilitate the right outcome at the end. <laughs> hmm. Bitter experience with the RPA myself mm. um yeah they, 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 they've got their rules and yes it's up to you bill to uh, educate them about the nuances please oh not, <laughs> you don't want much then <laughs> i think um, there, there, is, there is wood pasture though i mean there the, 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 the should be a um a, a classification of wood pasture but i can't remember what it was i'll have a little look on another device. Talk on, Helen. But I think um, actually the discussions around an agroforestry standard but are going to bring to head these issues. Mm, good. Because, you know, you can't, as you say, you know, you can't just separate them all out. So an agroforestry will clearly show that that's going to cause some challenges, you know, whether it's ar arable or pastoral, you know, we've got arable standards, we've got grassland standards, whereas the silver arable and silver pastoral system are going to fit. Right. Well, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm reassured to, to know that, you know, that others are concerned about it too. And, and in some ways that takes the pressure off. Thanks, Bill. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, need to, I'll need to move on. So uh, we, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Bill, very much. Uh, we, we need to, the, the, the objective is to produce a policy brief uh, that can be sent to policymakers based on this. So I'm just going to run through so some themes that I think have emerged from this. And I want you to add things that you think I've missed or things I've misinterpreted in the chat. Uh, the chat will stay open for another 15 minutes and, and you can input into that and we will review all these comments 
and incorporate them if, if appropriate into this policy brief, okay? Uh, if you'd like to see the policy brief, maybe you could indicate that as well. Uh, I'm not sure how appropriate it is to send it around everyone, but if you'd really like to see the policy brief and input it, please just put your name in the chat. Okay, so uh, from Tom, uh, Tom indicates that ag agroforestry and arable systems tend to shift uh, these agroecosystems towards more natural uh, community compositions, grassland and woodlands. But uh, uh, I, I wondered what the implications are. Uh, I think uh, one of the RSPB people asked what the implications might be for farms that depend on traditional farming uh, environments, you know, specialists, you know, it could have impact on that. From Tom, it seems to me there's a bit of a balance in agroforestry uh, that, uh, between it being an issue for pests and generation of pests and weeds on the one hand, or a system that generates pollinators and predators on the other hand and actually benefits your system and really quite precise effect management and augmentation of the agroforestry system. Right. Caroline indicates that uh, she, she works in a really quite quite a beautiful biodiverse place and, and ag, agro and reducing agroforestry in these systems have potentially has the damage to you know impact and impact biodiversity negatively so in, in cases like carolines maybe in contrast to arable systems which are, tend not to be quite so biodiverse you need very precise advice, advice and guidance uh, uh, and, and you need a landscape level approach as well Helen in her presentation highlighted uh, which was interesting for me lots of novel ways that you could pay for uh, you could pay for agroforestry through generating biodiversity. Uh, I, I hadn't really thought of these before. And uh, Helen also uh, indicated other possible funding models based on ammonia reduction, uh, reduction for agroforestry. So Helen, Helen seems to think uh, potentially agri there are alternative routes for payment uh, to get your agroforestry funded through bio biodiversity generation. Uh, in the general discussion, somebody brought up the issue, uh, Bill Grayson brought up the uh, potential issue of conflicts between grassland and agroforestry standards, and uh, Helen, uh, I think this will become clear, uh, a bit clearer tomorrow, tomorrow when Helen goes to this meeting, but Helen suggested that maybe ag the agroforestry standard could be add-ons to each of the existing standards, grassland standard, arable, arable standards, and so on. Which tree do you choose? Uh, another uh, Andrew Cuthbertson asked, asked. Depends on the soil, your needs from the agroforestry system. Do you need shade for your cattle? Do you have wet soil? If so, willow is appropriate. If you have dry soil, trees like oaks might be appro appropriate. Uh, commodity prices and, and what they're likely to do in the near future are an issue. You have to take that into account when you're planting your tree. Uh, and Caroline indicated that timber seems to be quite hot at the moment, and that there's probably a market for agroforesters to grow timber. Bio willow is a good tree if you want to go into the biomass market. Uh, and, and Helen emphasized that if you want to promote diversity through agroforestry, it's probably a good idea to plant by diversity of trees. Many, Tom indicated that many arable farms favor fruit due to the low height of trees and due to low light competition. Uh, optimum tree density, uh, it really depends on alley width, but uh, the, this standard of 24 meters, which 24 meter wide uh, alley width seems to be fairly common. And uh, there doesn't seem to be much of a trade-off uh, on, uh, with with uh, plant and density, uh, if, if you use that uh, alley width, uh, conflicts between uh, objectives uh, of of agroforestry, you know, biodiversity, carbon capture. How do these things conflict? Uh, farmers need to have their objectives very clear when they're designing the when they're uh, designing the system uh, to manage these conflicts conflicts and everyone agrees that there needs to be more clarity in the regulation around agroforestry. Uh, 
feasibility, feasibility of biodiversity again. Uh, Helen suggested uh, this biodiversity in that game. Helen suggested that there might be another novel me mechanism to pay for agroforestry through promoting uh, uh, biodiversity in that game and interacting with developers. However, another contributor uh, was a little bit uh, skeptical about this and suggested it might only be uh, might only be an appropriate and very narrow range of circumstances. Uh, one uh, one contributor brought up the issue of, of, of uh, agroforestry and interfering with drainage, uh, drainage field drainage. This seems to have been an issue that's come up before. People like Stephen Briggs have thought of it and managed it. And one of the contributors also indicated that there were fairly well defined ways of, ways of managing this. So to, sum up, to summarize, uh, I asked the summary question, uh, can agroforestry deliver biodiversity benefit in the UK and what does Elm need to do to deliver that? Uh, Caroline indicated that yes, but you need a landscape, uh, a landscape level approach to design in your system and you need an, and it needs appropriate funding. Helen indicates that we need appropriate advice and support and funding within Elm and also uh, indicates we need to, to take a landscape approach. The way we measure the benefits is going to be an issue with an elm. And you also need a whole farm approach. Tom also thinks it can, agroforestry can deliver biodiversity benefits in, in UK agroecosystems. He thinks it can deliver resilience and uh, most importantly, functional diversity, but it needs to be carefully integrated with other sustainable farming systems such as organic farming and policy needs to allow innovation. So that was my interpretation of some uh, sort of general themes that came up. The comments will be over for another 15 minutes. Uh, if you think there were, there were other things that emerged from this meeting that should be put into this policy brief, then I would ask you to, to add these in the comments and we will certainly consider them while we're, we're producing this policy brief. Uh, I just want to thank everyone that's, that's turned up uh, I found it interesting and I, I hope the, the audience did as well. And I'd like to thank the speakers because they've actually put in a lot of uh, behind the scenes work on this, emailing me their presentations for feedback and talking to each other to make sure all the talks were fully integrated and that. So uh, it hasn't been a case of them just turning up and doing it by any means. And uh, I would encourage you all to, to uh, attend either the streamed version or the in-person uh, version of the next uh, workshop at the Northern Real Farmers Workshop on the role of agroforestry and carbon sequestering. So thanks very much uh, to everyone and uh, we'll end it there. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Colin. That was good. We're leaving it open while uh, people let me know if they'd like to have the policy brief. We've had a couple of people say that they would like to. <laughs>